Thank you guys again for joining us for this panel, which is going to explore that most mysterious alchemical process, how do you train great teachers? So let's just start there. Um, Jacqueline, I'll start with you. Uh, is, is there, are there some components to a successful teacher training program that work no matter what, or the or standards, if you will? I think um, at Urban Teachers, we try to take a variety of different best practices and infuse those into our teachers. So every teacher we train has 14 months of intensive training with a master teacher, with a host teacher in their school. Um, they also have coursework on what it means to be a teacher, on pedagogy, um, and learning how to teach special education as well. Um, and and then beyond that, we coach them, so we support them. It's not that they arrive ready. Um, we spend three years coaching all of our teachers. So I think between our clinical placements, having a teacher that you can work with to learn the building blocks, um, excellent coursework and wonderful faculty and coaches, I think those are some of the building blocks. But that person also has to come wanting to reach every single student. Sure. Michael, what, in your experience at George Washington, what have you seen work? Well, we, we uh, put out roughly 100 new teachers uh, a year in elementary, secondary, and special education. I think the signature aspects of our, pro <laughs> of our uh, program, high technology. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Avoid it. Just stick mics. Ear pieces. <laughs> um, if there's an underlying uh, sort of theory of action in our preparation of future teachers, it is uh, to instill a spirit of pedagogical knowledge, that is real skill in the management and in the communication of the kind of knowledge and skills that we want our students in school to uh, benefit from, uh, and a good bit of content knowledge. Uh, professionals in this business will recognize as a certain kind of appreciation for what we call pedagogical content knowledge. And I would add to that that there is a, an increasing emphasis on experience. Mm -hmm. And we take very seriously the notion of enabling our teacher candidates to actually uh, work in communities of the sort where they are going to work when they graduate. And through this kind of community engagement and other uh, programs, uh, we think we're doing a pretty good job and uh, you're about to meet uh, one of our fine <laughs> alumni. Yes. And with that introduction, Claire, you went through the program. I mean, and you're on the front lines. You're a teacher at Banneker. Is there a skill you didn't realize you'd need that you've developed in, in, as, as a teacher? There are several. <laughs> um, but I, I think the first major one was learning to meet students where they are when they come into your room. And so learning to uh, really assess them and think about uh, the skills that they need to be uh, to move forward. So learning to do close reading and guided reading and other types of instruction that really uh, leverage a student's literacy skills was really important for me. Well, let me just drill into that a little bit because uh, just on a sort of practical or maybe anecdotal level, what does it mean to meet a stu student where he or she is from, from a teaching perspective? Yeah, well, I think it I'm probably still figuring that out. Um, I have a couple of students in the audience that maybe could enlighten <laughs> us more. They will but, get um, their chance in a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it took me a couple of years to really um, feel like I was, I, I didn't grow up in the DC area, so it took me a couple of years really to get to know the communities that I was working in, to get to know um, the families and students and what their goals, goals were and, and, and what their needs were, and then also what, um, what skills they already brought to the table that I could really um, capitalize on and um, create a, a strong classroom community of learners. What do you do, and I would ask this to both of you guys, when someone clearly doesn't have the skills to be a teacher? What, what do we do with someone who does not have the aptitude to be in the field? So we work really hard with all of our residents and fellows to make sure that we are giving them as much support as we can. We really believe that if somebody has the will and we can get, provide the skills, that we are going to try to move them. But we also hold them to a really high bar. Every urban teacher's teacher has to show that they can demonstrate gains with the students that we work with. And if they're not able to do that, then we gently move them 
to other things. But the work is so critical. Our students don't get to repeat this day or this grade, and we have to move them at such a fast pace that if we realize after putting in as much support as we can that they're not ready for this, we will help them find something else. It doesn't mean they can't work with students, but our students have such critical needs that every single day matters. And so we believe in strong support, but we also believe in high degrees of accountability. Uh, Michael, I'd ask you the same from an administrative point of view. What do you do? Well, you use the word aptitude, and I'm, I'm not so sure I'm a big fan of that anymore. Uh, I think our basic proposition is that the students who come to us, first of all, many of them are already teaching or have been in some way involved in education, and they want to advance in their careers, and they want to improve their skills and their knowledge, and they want to become advanced professionals. Uh, some of them will do better than others, and I've had this conversation with my colleagues who are the deans of the law school, engineering school, medical school. Uh, we all have this situation. Right. We have people who, who come to us because they have certain career aspirations, and some of them end up being somehow quicker at becoming really proficient at it. Overall, I think this is one of the, the myths about teacher preparation, uh, perhaps in America more than elsewhere, it is this idea that uh, people are supposed to come out after their preparation and be ready to, to meet all of the challenges on the first day at work. And as you've heard here from Claire, uh, it actually takes a certain, more, a, a certain degree more of agility and flexibility and uh, learning by doing. Uh, those are things that are not instantly appreciable when you're observing students in, a, in, a, in higher education who are preparing themselves for a career, but we hope to instill in them that kind of agility of mind and behavior that they will become increasingly better in this profession. Right. Medic doctors have residencies, and yeah. we rarely afford that um, time to teachers, although I want to talk a little bit about urban teachers because you guys have a different philosophy as far as that is concerned. And tell us a little bit more. Absolutely. Just like if you're in medical school, you need to learn stitches before you learn surgery, right? Yeah, like right. this is big, big swaths of, of learning here. With us, we really want to provide our teachers with all the skills that they're going to need to work in the communities that we serve. And that's why we spend over a year really preparing them really working with a school that is the kind of school we're going to place you in, really getting coursework that you can use with your students. We don't just train you in your content, we also train you in special education. Um, and one of my teachers put it to me in a great way a few months ago. She said, Jacqueline, you know, I thought that my students needed to learn the way I taught them, but I realized that I need to teach the way my students learn. Mm -hmm. And she's like, because I know how to teach different types of learners, I feel like I could be effective in doing that. Um, and our philosophy really is that we are training teachers for the long haul and supporting them and keeping them in a way that, they will, that we can get the best outcomes for our students. Um, and so we really do believe that that kind of immersion alongside support is what's gonna help us keep teachers um, in the district and in Baltimore and in other, the other regions where we work. Claire, what is, in your mind, the most effective way of evaluating teachers in the classroom? Mm. Well, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've grown up under the district's impact system. Um, literally, it started the year I began. Um, I think that has some, some use in the impact system. You're rated on a, a series of... Uh, things that you do in the classroom, check for understanding. Is your, you have an objective driven lesson? Are you using effective routines and procedures? Um, so I think that has a place. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, the, I think it's important to hear from the students, certainly, about you know, what's working for them. Is, is the teacher meeting their needs? Um, it's tricky. Uh, Michael, I would ask this, yeah. you, know, what, what, you know, how do you think about the evaluation process? So we think about that a lot. Um, it's funny because uh, the teaching profession is sometimes criticized for not wanting to accept uh, modes of uh, accountability or evaluation and all that. In fact, I think it's one of the most evaluated professions we have. And uh, there is a lot of debate about what combination of metrics and measures, uh, observational, rather more quantitative, uh, and in what sort of mix uh, can really be useful 
for this concept of evaluation? But my, my basic answer is to, to answer with a question, which is what's the purpose of the evaluation? Right. If it is to provide important information to teachers to improve their craft, that requires a different set of data and information and a different style of measurement than if you're trying to produce a general sort of uh, overview of the quality of teaching in a district, in a school, or in a, for that matter, in a, in a country. So it's very important that we persist in looking for evaluation methods that make sense in terms of the purposes to which those uh, evaluations are going to be put. <clears throat> which is a broad and nuanced answer, <laughs> I would say. Well, I'm a dean. What yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I guess I would, you know, the, the idea that teachers teach to the test, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how is that unavoidable in some ways? Look, uh, we, we now have abundant evidence, uh, perhaps sadly, sadly so, that uh, as the uh, in, as the consequences associated with a measurement system become more severe, there is more likelihood that there will be efforts to game the system in ways that undermine the quality of the measures and actually distort the teaching and learning process. This is one of the great, uh, I suppose, I wouldn't necessarily call it a tragedy compared to other tragedies in the world, but it's up there. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of history with the over-reliance on very high stakes measures that are well-intentioned to some extent because we do want to get information about how well our teachers are doing. But the effect has been uh, to create incentives and, and, um, and, and distortions. Uh, so we have to watch out for that. And the teaching to the test is one, one example. Uh, Jacqueline, when we talk about teaching, there's, it, it, there's so much debate. Uh, surrounding the profession, then when we talk about the curriculum itself, that too is fraught. And a large part of today, especially in panels that I've witnessed and, and been a part of, we've talked about sort of the, the racial and socioeconomic aspects um, uh, that affect both teachers and students in the classroom. And I guess from, from, a, from a training teacher perspective, how do you talk about you know, teaching in this day and age when so many subjects are so racialized and so polarized, when you have someone like Donald Trump, who is likely the Republican nominee, how do you teach teachers to talk about that in a way that is acceptable and theoretically a neutral? I think that's, a, that's an incredibly good question. Um, for us, we've realized that teacher training is not this static thing, that it's fluid. Um, and I think one of the needs at Urban Teachers that we've identified is the need to train teachers around race and equity. And this is a new need for us. We thought, we're going to give you pedagogy, we're going to give you support, but how do we talk about race and privilege and class, right, and Black Lives Matter, and all of the things that, are, that matter for our students in a way that, they, that our teachers can really grapple with this. Um, at Urban Teachers, over 40% of our teachers are teachers of color. Like that is a metric that is critical to us, but we also have to unpack class and privilege and race if we're going to reach the students that we serve. Um, and in our work, we have a really in-depth course called Foundations where we bring all of our residents in and one of the first things they do is take a field trip of the, the neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. that are underserved. And we talk to them about the fact that they have a four-year commitment to our community. And it's really important to us that they understand the assets and strengths of the communities that they're now working in mm -hmm. versus the deficit-based model that they've traditionally been taught. Um, so that's a big question, but I think we are continuing to take ba baby steps and to continue learning about the elements of our communities that are so important. Like, we do not serve, underserved communities aren't there by accident. Um, there are a lot of policies that impact why they are that way, and for us it's really critical that we unpack this in a way that our teachers will be able to reach our students. We don't all have to look the same or have the same background, but you have to make sure that you're making learning relevant to them. Claire, I would ask you, you know, if you, especially in certain classrooms, we have white teachers teaching students of color. I mean, talk to us about that dynamic when you're talking about issues of racial inequity. Yeah, I think just being honest and um, open is, is key. Um, when we read a piece of literature that has, um, language in it that um, I, I like to preface it with, I'm going to be reading what the text says, just so you know, this isn't, it's not my words. 
um, but this is this is what it says, um, and and just to to acknowledge that you're you know my my background is different than most of my students, um, but we have other things in common and we can still um, learn from each other and um, we're all part of the same conversation. Michael, how do you prepare teachers for sort of the emotional impact of going into the classroom in a, in a sort of moment like this? Uh, well, um, how do we prepare them? It, it, look, it's, uh, it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. It, it requires a combination of um, appreciation of the, the multiple challenges that a teacher is going to face in a classroom. I actually like to tell, to the extent that I get to talk to some of our students who are becoming teachers, I like to remind them that according to some of the best research, teaching in a modern American classroom is more complicated than doing neurosurgery. <laughs> yeah. And that they should realize that they're going into something that is going to require a certain amount of tolerance of ambiguity, uh, probably a certain amount of um, willingness to fail on the way to success, and that the more important thing is to try to figure out how in an environment like that, one can develop a cadre, a spirit, among the professionals so that there can be some support, some interaction, and some ongoing learning. Now, if any of that sounds strange, it isn't in all other professions. Right. It's a little bit strange in the world of teachers, and that's something that I'm hoping that we can eventually try to correct as a society. It seems like one of the battle lines here is the perception battle. Um, and for so long, we've been taught culturally, I think, in pop culture and movies, that teacher, great teachers are sort of natural whizzes. It's stand and deliver. You walk into the classroom, you immediately have a command of and a relationship to these children because you're just that good, right? But in reality, I mean, the comparison to neurosurgery is apt, right? This is, these are skills that you are trained for, that you learn, mistakes that you make that you then correct. Do you think we are closer as a society to understanding that, Jacqueline? I am hopeful that we are. Um, I do still think people kind of think they show up and it's magical. Right. Um, and one of the reasons that I, I love the work I do is because I watch someone come in very nervous but very ambitious into the work and slowly get their toolkit together and then get to effectiveness. So it is possible, but it's a lot of work. I mean, we know that it is hours upon hours, um, and I think we need to reframe the narrative. You're not going to feel good on day one. You might not feel good for your one and two, maybe three and four, and that's okay. You You'll know? be seasick for right? seven years. Exactly, <laughs> but you will get there if you put the work in. So, Claire, what's your relationship uh, to your student, to the student, te the, sorry, the family teacher relationship, parent teacher relationship, and how critical has that been to your success? Well, I wish I had um, tried to develop earlier on a strong family relationship um, with families of my students, um, but I. I have luckily been trained um, in, you know, creating proactive now uh, strong relationships with families and um, doing home visits, not in a negative sense, but in a just get to know you sort of sense. Like a doctor. Like house calls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and I, I only wish now that I had known sooner how to do that and had some of those skills in my toolbox that I could have used. Mm -hmm. Um, on that note, I want to open up the floor to some questions from the audience. If you want to raise your hands, we have mics going around. Don't be afraid. Down here, maybe? Over there. Okay. I really appreciate all the things you've had to say, and I think they're very good. I, I guess the overriding concern I have is that we're really perfecting a model of a, of a buggy in an age of self-driven cars and that the rest of the world, not all of it, but a good portion of it that's developing quickly has, is doing a better job at educating their young people than we are, at least those who are out there competing. How do, how do we step beyond doing what we do better and move on to something that would move us from buggies to self-driven cars in education? Michael, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, I, was, I was kind of waiting for the international comparison question. Yeah. Up, so, <laughs> well, here, uh, here it here is. Here we are. Uh, look, here's, here's the narrative that we're dealing with in, in the environment of teacher preparation and education generally, and it goes something like this. It is that 
fortunately, social science has caught up with a lot of intuitive and experiential knowledge about the importance of teachers and teaching in the lives of children and in their education. We look around at other countries that seem to be outperforming us on at least some comparative measures, and we are a little bit uh, distressed at where we stand in some of these rankings, although I must say that some of those things are, are blown out of proportion. And then we realize that because teachers and teaching matter so much, that the fault, that the, the explanation for where we stand in these rankings must have something to do with the quality of the teachers. And if it's the fault of the teachers, that must be the fault of, their, of where they were prepared. So there you have it. That's why I worry about this, because I'm the <laughs> dean of an education school, so naturally. Uh, but at every point along that logical chain, there is enough evidence to at least cause us, to, to, to make us want to hit the pause button and make sure that we've actually got this right. So my, my answer to you is, I'm not so sure that we are in a world of buggies when it comes to the preparation of our young people for the future. I see evidence of schools and schooling and teachers in many communities, including not only those that have the benefit of teachers who were uh, prepared at the George Washington University, but elsewhere as well, who are doing remarkably good work with their, with their students, who are preparing them for lives of ethical and productive participation in our democracy. And uh, I think that some of this uh, somewhat overzealous preoccupation with how we're doing on some metrics compared to other countries is leading us toward uh, policies and programs that are ultimately counterproductive. Now that may be even more harshly stated than I usually <laughs> say it, but that's what I worry about a little bit. And I would, I would just offer that people who want to visit some of these classrooms might actually see uh, some remarkable uh, opportunities and some, and some, and some real uh, cause for hope. Jacqueline, do you want to take a stab at that really quick before we go? Yeah, I think that we have to continue innovating, and I don't think we can do it quickly enough. Um, we have to be honest about what works for our students, and I think it's really reframing our teaching and the way that our students learn best and not being afraid to do that. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Claire, Michael, Jacqueline, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. all of you. Thank you.